From Amman, Jordan, and streaming globally across the World Wide Web, this is The Fetch, and you are live inside the eye. Today's date is Saturday, August 25th, 2012, and we are getting towards the end of summer. And boy, do we have a great September lineup already lined up for you. So, But, you know, you're going to want to check that out. But before we get into that, we have an exceptional show and guest lined up today. Now, to all of you in the United States time zones, a good morning to you. And to all of you in European or Asian time zones, of course, a good early or late evening. Uh, even tomorrow, of course, if you're on the east coast of Australia, I believe. So to all of you staying over from the Jeff Rents Radio rebroadcast, thanks for staying. And indeed, you are not going to want to miss the show today. Be, be, being as I am here in Amman, uh, let's see here, being as I am here in Amman, you know, there's quite a lot of buzz going on. Now, the people here are very much into politics. You know, very, very much into politics. And being close, so close to the action here, of course, you get to hear a lot of different things. Now, people are split on this so-called Arab Spring, okay? People really haven't figured it out yet here in the Middle East. But people are beginning to wake up to the fact that the Arab Spring is really an international Jewish project headed up by America's Jewish elite. Now, Syria represents a pivot point uh, in this so-called Jewish strategy to reorder the Middle East. Now, no one is happier with the results of what's going on here in the Middle East than is the State of Israel and, of course, international Jewish interests. Now, this week, the United Nations Observer Mission to Syria, they have officially quit and left Syria. Two reporters uh, in the Syri two reporters in Syria now are either reported as either killed or missing. One is a Japanese female uh, camera operator. She's an award-winning uh, camera uh, reporter and an American ex-special forces officer turned embed reporter for the foreign forces operating in Syria. Both of these people were working on behalf and embed into the Free Syrian Army. Syrian and rebel forces are bogged down now in a war to control vital supply lines in Aleppo, which is going to run from Turkey on into Syria. Lebanon has seen days of low-level skirmishes between Alawite and Lebanese Sunni supporters of the invasion of Syria. Syrian rebel kidnappings have intensified, resulting in kidnappings taking place on Lebanese soil. Qatar and Saudi have warned their citizens now to quit and leave Lebanon. There are now protests being headed up in Egypt against the new quote-unquote Islamic President Mercy. Here in Jordan, there were reports that Qatar offered and the United States offered Jordan U.S. $17 billion in loan forgiveness plus an additional U.S. $7 billion in cash if only the Jordanian army could push into Syria, create a buffer zone, and send weapons to the rebels. King Abdullah has reported to have rejected that flatly, stating basically that who do I send them to? Al-Qaeda so they can come back and fight against me? Thanks, but no thanks. Now, joining me to discuss this and so much more is uh, uh, Imran Nazar Hossein from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. He is an Islamic scholar, uh, well-spoken, well-respected in, uh, in international circles. So you're going to definitely want to stay for this show. We'll see you right back after this break. This is The Fetch. You're listening to Inside the Eye Line, intelligent media for the politically aware here on the Oracle Broadcasting Network. Okay, welcome back, everybody. It is The Fetch. You're listening to Inside the Eye Live, intelligent media for the politically aware here on the Oracle Broadcasting Network. It's Saturday morning to you, August 25th, 2005. If you haven't joined us yet, definitely come on over to the chat room, InsideTheEyeLive.com. Click on the live chat button on the toolbar, the menu bar up on the top, and you'll get right into the chat room. Love to have you. Already a good crowd, and as always, a good crowd. Now, joining me from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, is Islamic scholar Imran Hossein. Now, Imran was born in the Caribbean island of Trinidad in 1942 from parents whose ancestors has, had migrated as indentured laborers from India. Now, he is a graduate of the Alamiya Institute in Karachi and has studied at several institutions of higher learning, including the University of Karachi, the University of the West Indies, Al-Azhar University, and the Graduate Institute of International Relations in Switzerland. 
He has worked for several years as a foreign service officer in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the government of Trinidad and Tobago, but he had gave that job up in 1985 to devote his life to his mission within Islam. Now he is the author of over a dozen books on Islam and its place in contemporary society, and his YouTube presence has generated literally millions upon millions of views. So without further ado, uh, again from Kuala Lumpur is Imran. Imran, welcome indeed inside the I Live. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, it's not morning, but it's late night here. It's past 11 o'clock at night in Kuala Lumpur, in Malaysia. Mm-hmm. And I thank you for your kind invitation. Yeah. Since I live in Amman, Cape Hale. Alhamdulillah. 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 Tamam, Koyas. Tamam, friends. All right. Uh, for everybody, that is just how are you <laughs> in the local Arabic vernacular. Now, uh, Imran, we just finished Ramadan season. Uh, we discussed this last night. I talked a lot about it on my show, of course, coming from Amman. Uh, can you share a little bit about uh, what is Ramadan like in Malaysia? It's a very enjoyable experience uh, here in Malaysia. It's different from back home in the Caribbean, where we are a small uh, Muslim minority. And here the majority population is uh, Muslim. And so it's wonderful already to, to see the whole city fasting, to see the whole country fasting, and to see the non-Muslim Malaysians showing respect uh, for Islam and for the Muslim fast of Ramadan, where elsewhere in the world, in many places, uh, the Zionists are waging war on this guy's war on Islam. So it's refreshing to be in this part of the world, and I'm sure many in the American audience who are listening to me would share this view that it's very refreshing to be in a part of the world where you do not feel the sting of the war on Islam. Now I have a question. Here in Amman we have, of course, a lot of Saudis come during summertime because it's just too hot in Riyadh and Saudi this time of year. But when Ramadan is summertime like it is now, all the wives call and say to the husband, you come home now. Do you have this same problem situation in Malaysia? <laughs> no, no, the temperature, the temperature is a little bit milder here in Malaysia, uh, and there's rain. One of the wonderful things about Malaysia and Southeast Asia is the continuous rainfall all through the year, uh, and so there's greenery all around. And when an Arab comes from Saudi Arabia or from other parts of the world in the Arab world, and the see this lush greenery all around, it looks like heaven to them. So here in Jordan, the the wives are also known as the Mukhabarat, or the Secret Service. So when they say, come home, uh, the Mukhabarat's not calling the husbands home during Ramadan. Well, I I can't speak about the the conduct of the uh, Jordanian men, because I have never lived in Jordan. I just passed through a man while traveling several times. Um, but uh, yes, we do live in an age in which there is a breakdown of sexual morals around the world. And thank God for Ramadan. <laughs> there you go. For Ramadan, yes. Ramadan calls you back. There you go. Strange. Now you were telling me it's kind of like uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas combined for, for Islamic society. Yes, because in um, in, in Malaysia, uh, the, the exodus of people that you find in the United States at the time of Thanksgiving, everybody heading back home to their families wherever they are, uh, airports packed, uh, the roads packed, uh, the same experience we have here at the time of uh, Eid, at the end of the month of Ramadan. Except that in Malaysia it's a little bit different. That elsewhere in the world we celebrate the end of Ramadan with three days of festivity. Three days of uh, enjoyment, of visiting friends and family and so on. But over here in Malaysia they celebrate for the whole month. (laughs) That's a a two month holiday for Ramadan. (laughs) Two months, yes. Uh, I got a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. 
they, they, they work during Ramadan. Ramadan is not a month of holiday. Correct. No, but it's when no Ramadan sound of... Then it's the time for the holiday, yeah. yeah. Now, I had Jim Fetzer, Scholars for 9-11 Truth, here uh, two weeks ago, I believe, and he mentioned problems with Wikipedia. Now, when I was doing my research for this show, I went to your Wikipedia page, and where Jim Fetzer had his Wikipedia altered heavily, yours has simply been deleted. Are you aware of that? I hardly ever go to take a look at it. I must go and do that. Yeah, your Wikipedia page, apparently people aren't too happy with you. Uh, we call Wikipedia Zaya or Jupedia because of the heavy influence of the Hasbarat. You know, they go in and alter the pages. But you, they're not happy with. I think they just deleted your page. Okay. It's gone. I was not aware of yeah. <laughs> It's gone. It's gone. So, yeah, I, I thought that was rather interesting. Uh, speaking this morning, we're going to just get into this real quick. We've got about a minute and a half to go. You mentioned what, why you are really interesting or you have such a unique perspective on, on Zionism, on Islam and the global scene is because you were actually educated in geopolitics. Can you get into that real quick, your, your education, real quick, one minute? Yes, I, I, I did my university education uh, for one year in Egypt and then I went on to Pakistan where I studied at Karachi University, did a master's degree in philosophy. And then at the Alimia Institute of Islamic Studies, I completed a five-year course in Islamic Studies. And then when I returned to Trinidad, I applied for a job in the foreign ministry, and I was interviewed. And they said, we'd love to have you in the ministry, but we want you to go back to university and do uh, studies, postgraduate studies in international relations. And that was a wonderful opportunity for me. I studied first in the West Indies and then in Geneva. Uh, international politics, international economics, international monetary economics. And it was wonderful to do this after studying Islam. And with that, I'll tell you, when we come back, we're going to go into Imr Imran's time in the United States. You're listening to the Fetch here on Inside the Live on the Oracle Broadcasting Network. And welcome back. It's the Fetch with Imran Hussein, Islamic scholar from Kuala Lumpur. And you're listening to Inside the Eye Live right here on the Oracle Broadcasting Network. Uh, again, the chat room, Inside the Eye Live. Click on the live chat uh, button up there on the menu bar and come right in. As always, a very good crowd in the chat room. Imran, welcome back. Thank you. And then, uh, just going real back now, you finished your education. We, we talked about your education with, you really, to, to, to prep you for, for the foreign ministry in Trinidad and Tobago. But you spent a lot of time in the United States. It was after um, I resigned my job in the foreign ministry, after I completed my contract with government, uh, I left the, I left Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, it's pronounced Tobago, not Tobago, eh? We, <laughs> Tobago. <laughs> Tobago, that's right. Uh, I, I went back to Pakistan to join the institute where I had studied as a student. And I survived for two years and then I left and went to the United States. Uh, and I spent a total of 12 years in the United States, now, in Miami and then in New York. Now, your time in New York, you were Director of Islamic Studies for the Joint Committee of Muslim Organizations of Greater New York. That's right. Uh, uh, so what was this period like with you in a city where you had to really deal with a lot of the Jewish influence, American Jewish influence? It in was an extremely, extremely extremely beneficial experience for me. I was very lucky. I, I don't know how many Islamic scholars get this kind of a luck that I had to first study Islam and philosophy and then go to international politics and international economics and international monetary economics and the history of international relations and then go to New York City which uh, was the center of the world at that time. And what, uh, what time was this? Imran, when was this? I, I arrived in, in the United States in 1959 and I left in 2001. Okay. Um, it was only about 12 years. But um, nearly every single Muslim community in the world 
uh, have representatives in New York. You have Albanian Muslims, you have Muslims from Bosnia, you have uh, Muslims from Egypt, from Bangladesh, from all over the world. And it was wonderful for me to be able to meet these people and interact with them and to teach them and to go to their masjid, plural of masjid. Um, in addition to that, I, I was fortunate to make contact with Christian organizations and with Jewish organizations. And uh, they invited me to come to their synagogues. And I gave, I lectured in synagogues. Um, I lectured to uh, a, a convention of Methodist ministers up in upstate New York. And uh, it was a wonderful uh, experience for me, an educational experience for me. It enriched me. And I thank the Lord for it. What was your um, experience working with the Jewish community in New York? I learned many things about Jewish business practice that was less than, uh, with which I was less than happy. Um, unfortunately, this seems to be a characteristic of some Jews, I'm sure not all Jews, um, of business practices which are really not ethical. And as a result, there was a considerable resentment in many parts of the world where Jews lived and uh, did business. A kind of a one-way one -way business. Uh, business transactions should be such that uh, both sides benefit. Both sides benefit. Mm -hmm. But when there is a suction of wealth <laughs> from, from one to another, and one community growing constantly wealthier and the others growing poorer, and that's, an, and that's a recipe for eventual hatred and animosity and even violence. And that was something that uh, disturbed me when I learned about it in New York. Uh, but on the other hand, it was wonderful to be able to engage in dialogue with Jewish rabbis. Uh, and I learned a lot, uh, which uh, that experience that I had is now now come uh, to be very valuable for me at this late stage of my life uh, when we are now located at a moment in history perhaps even more dangerous and more important than that in the summer of 1914 when the First World War uh, began. And that, I think we are now, yeah. now in a more important and a more dangerous moment. Yeah, yeah and actually we're going to get into that later in the show too with some of your Islamic perspectives on the end of times type of concepts. Uh, going back real quick now, you spent a lot of time then with interfaith dialogues. So you have a lot of experience uh, working in the interfaith world. I did have some experience, not as much as I would have liked to, but after a while I believed that I had learned enough and there was no need for me to Fair go enough. further. Fair enough. Yeah. Now you, the Jumaa prayer, that's the Friday prayers, correct? That's right. Now you delivered these, it says here at this, delivered the service at the United Nations headquarters in Manhattan once a month for 10 years. That's right, for 10 years continuously. I think I, I have the record as the only one who did that. <laughs> and to those of you, to those who aren't familiar, what exactly are the Jumaa prayers? I know here, being a man, but why don't you educate the audience? What is Jumaa prayers and the significance and, and of okay. course your importance in delivering those? We have uh, prayer, uh, which is uh, private, that you perform in the privacy of your home or in lonely spots where the heart speaks directly to the Lord. Um, and then there is public prayer, uh, where we must assemble uh, five times a day for congregational prayer, and that helps to build the solidarity of the community. Um, and then there is the prayer on Friday, where all the villages are supposed to leave, villages are supposed to leave and go to the city. And so you have a larger gathering for the prayer on Fridays, and that consolidates again the integrity and the solidarity 
of the greater capability. On that occasion, uh, the Friday prayer, the Quran asks that you shut down your businesses. Shut it down and hasten to the prayer. Correct. That happens a lot here in the Middle East. Now, what about the use, just real quick to move it along, what about the usage of the prayer here in the Middle East for political purposes like happened in Egypt? It is supposed to be an occasion for public education in the sermon and for building public morale uh, and strengthening faith, uh, educating the people. That's what the sermon is supposed to be. But the, the uh, imam who conducts the service, who delivers the sermon, normally is given the privilege of choosing his own topic and choosing his own script, his own words. It is lamentable that we now have governments which have established their different departments to taking control. And uh, these departments present a script to you and uh, when you go to the Friday prayer, the Imam reads out that script. <laughs> That's, That's uh, actually interesting, Imran. We're going into break. I didn't know that was actually going on. This is the press with guest Imran Hussain here on Inside the Eye Live Intelligent Media for the Politically Aware here on the Oracle Broadcasting Network. And welcome back. That's my favorite Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon song, Saturday in the Park. Welcome, everybody. The temperature here in Amman, Jordan. We're about 31 degrees, 91, 91 and a half. Uh, Fahrenheit, if you're on the Fahrenheit scale, which I know a lot of you are being in the States. Uh, Imran, oh, by the way, wind, uh, we're about 14 kilometers. You'll have to do your own calculation. Imran, what's the weather like over there in Kuala Lumpur? Uh, it's a cool evening over here, rather it's a cool night over here. Um, we want the same temperature in the daytime. 91. What's your, what's your humidity like? Um, it's not too humid at this time. Um, when the rain falls, uh, there can be humidity. Mm -hmm. So it's just nice weather. It's nice weather, yes. Now, do you really have a winter season over there? No, no. Southeast Asia <laughs> does not have summer and winter. Uh, we in the Caribbean, we've got a dry season and the rainy season. And one part of the year, the rain doesn't fall. The grass turns brown and you have bushfires and sun. Um, and then in the other part of the year, you have a lot of rain. Yeah, I think you uh, might share the same latitude as us in Jordan, and we all have the same weather. But here in Malaysia, it's rain all through the year. Which so is nice. Green. Everything's green. Yeah. Everything is green all through the year. Now, I have, I have cats. I've had to sequester them. My network is back live at the house. First day I'm broadcasting from my home studio in about in about three weeks, actually. Uh, so I got like uh, six cats running around the house. you have any animals in the house? No, we don't. <laughs> no cats, no dogs? Yeah, just, no, no, it, no, huh? no cats, no dogs, no. Uh, I've had to push all the cats outside except for two kittens, but they're still in a box. So they're not going to hurt us <laughs> during the show. Uh, I'll tell you. Uh, real quick, I want to touch on that subject before we left the break. And you're talking about how certain governments are actually handling handy the imam's political statements that they are to read or to script as part of the Friday prayers? Part and parcel of the process of tamping down on Islam and uh, re re removing the threat of Islam to those who control power in the world uh, involves the tamping down on the masjid to make sure that the masjid is under the control of government. And uh, when the masjid is under control of the government, then the government also control the sermon that is delivered in the masjid. And this is a very uh, sad state of affairs in many parts of the world today, that we no longer have the freedom to choose our own topics, and to speak on the topics as our heart and our mind determine that we should do so. Yeah. Um, so this is a retrograde step, yes. Okay. Now you were in America up until pre-9-11, correct? Yes, I left the United States two weeks after 9-11. After 9-11, okay. Yeah. 
two weeks after 9-11 to why go did, to... Why did you leave? I left to go on a pre-arranged Islamic lecture tour of South Africa. And uh, while I was in just, South Africa... Sorry, I'm going to interrupt real quick. Was South Africa still apartheid at the time? No. I don't no, remember. No. I don't remember. Okay, go ahead. Uh, while I was in South Africa, uh, the United States uh, attacked innocent Afghanistan. Afghanistan, the poorest country in the world. Afghanistan, which had waged a war for 12 years for liberation from Soviet occupation. And this Afghanistan is now blamed unjustly for 9-11. I think most Americans are now aware that that's a monstrous lie and they should be ashamed, absolutely ashamed of themselves, the Zionists who have perpetrated this lie upon the people at the point of assault sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, it is disgraceful. And the one thing about lies is that the Lord who created the world and who sustains the world has built this world as a moral order. And as a moral order, it does not sustain lies. One day, your lie is going to explode in your face. Well, I think these lies are. Uh, not something you want to get into now, but yeah, I think I think now there are shows like this popping up all over America. Uh, you're, yeah. you're getting those of us who would not have been in the political process involved because we do not like what's happened to our country. And so, so the I, first step is awareness, as you know. Once I learned that the United States had launched an attack on Afghanistan, I took a decision that I am not going to return to the United States because I treasure my freedom to speak. During the ten years that I was in New York, I enjoyed a tremendous amount of freedom to speak. But once 9-11 took place, I understood that that freedom would no longer exist. And so I chose not to return to the United States. Number one, in solidarity with the innocent people of Afghanistan and then of Iraq. And number two, in order to preserve my freedom and independence of the Salah of Islam. And it has paid off. It has paid off because around the world today there is a growing uh, recognition uh, of the value of my scholarship. Hmm. You know, when you left the United States, you obviously, went, anybody that spends a lot of time, you 12 years, uh, but anybody who spends a lot of time in the United States really gets to understand the country and its people and the good part of the country. Uh, do you have any emotions for the country that, that what the United States was and how it's become now? Well, first of all, I am also a student of history. And uh, for me, it remains one of the most of the modern age uh, that so many Americans have forgotten and are no longer interested in the early history of the United States. And innocent people lived on that land, and beautiful people lived on that land. And while they lived on that land, they showed such respect for the land, respect for the water, respect for animals, respect for the clouds, the American Indian people. Mm -hmm. And that they should have been treated the way they were treated by those who came from Europe. Who went Indian hunting the way they went buffalo hunting. They would kill buffaloes for sport. Whereas an Indian will only kill a buffalo when he needed food. And when he killed that buffalo, every single part of that body which could be utilized productively was used. Nothing, nothing. But, but nothing. having grown up in a Christian family, not being Christian now, but having grown up in one, this, this idea that you're referring to, to me, traces back to Torah and this idea of subduing the earth. And they would take the idea of subduing the earth to mean exactly what you're talking about. Do you have the same were, ideas? I think there were there was a hidden agenda at work. And some of those, or many of those who left Europe to go to the United States in search of a new life, in search of wealth, in search of freedom, were perhaps unaware of the hidden agenda. 
But that hindered agenda is manifesting itself clearly today in those who control power in the United States, who control the media, who control politics, who control, control the banking system. And they do so on behalf of the State of Israel. It's the Zionist Judeo-Christian Alliance. Um, that alliance was at work. It had a hidden agenda in the uh, movement of people from Europe to the United States. And um, it pursued that hidden agenda, I think, in a very subtle way, uh, that even Benjamin Franklin was not aware uh, of what was coming ahead of him. Uh, when he spoke about the dangers of the banking system and so on. Mm -hmm. um, they, they operated it clandestinely, they operated with great skill and cunning, and they were able to hoodwink many of those who left to Europe and go to the United States uh, innocently. Uh, but what, what I was referring to was the barbaric, the barbaric massacre and unjust oppression uh, of the American Indian people by a people who by moral standards were far inferior to these American Indians, who showed a tremendous respect for the world of the sacred, who showed respect for the rivers as sacred, for the land as sacred and the trees as sacred. That world of the sacred that the American Indian understood and loved the wind was sacred. He spoke to the wind, he spoke to the trees, he spoke to the leaves. That world of the sacred that the American Indian had. Yeah, but I think even even Rome, you know, to carry that further historically, going into break. But Rome destroyed much of Northern Europe's uh, culture that was this way also. Hey, it's the Fetch inside the Eye Live here in the Oracle Broadcasting this And welcome back. It's the Fetch. You are live inside the Eye on the Oracle Broadcasting Network. Coming to you live from Amman, Jordan, where again the weather's about 91, 91 and a half degrees Fahrenheit, wind 14 kilometers out of the west, which is of course our favorite country that we don't like to like is Israel, uh, which is kind of like a non-country. Imran, welcome back to Inside the Eye Live. Thank you. Got a question for you. I've got lots of questions for you. Uh, you, you talked about the surreptitious sort of agenda within uh, the, the crafting of the American state, the United States. But there's another hidden agenda deep in subsurface, and that is this idea of a clash of civilizations, this clash of the quote-unquote West against Islam. Is this something that is discussed much within Islamic societies? And did you sense this when you were in the United States, that this was afoot? Um one could already perceive from the time of the European Crusades uh, that there was an agenda of war on Islam which uh, was restricted to Europe. It was not a Christian crusade. No, because no other Christians joined it. Uh, even the crusaders went to Byzantium, they fought against their own Christian brothers. And they sacked Constantinople. And they took over Hagia Sophia and made it a Roman Catholic cathedral. Um, so it was a European obsession with Islam, uh, which commenced all the way since the crusades, and which has continued until the British army defeated the Ottoman Islamic army and took over Jerusalem in uh, November, I think it was, of 1917. And then the British General Allenby declared today the Crusades are over. What nonsense. The Crusades were never finished. The Crusades are still continuing. Um, and the demonization of Islam is not difficult to understand. Those who want to control power in the world on behalf of the State of Israel they do so because they want Israel to rule the world. And you cannot understand that subject without eschatology. A degree in political science from a university is not going to help you. You need to study eschatology. 
uh, Christian eschatology, Jewish eschatology, Islamic eschatology. And in order for Israel to rule the world, Israel has to try to subdue or eliminate all potential rivals and obstacles. And long, long, long ago, the Judeo-Christian alliance that is backing Israel understood that the most formidable obstacle in the world standing in the way of Israel, standing in the way of a, a Zionist Jewish state in the Holy Land, and for that state to eventually rule the world, is the Muslim world, is the religion of Islam. And so it was not, uh, we, we cannot look at this from a micro uh, perspective uh, to, to see whether or not during the years that I was in the United States there was any resentment against Islam, but rather from a macro perspective where you see the movement of history in one unbroken line from Europe of, of constant, constant, constant targeting of Islam in many cunning, cunning ways as well, in order to eventually subdue Islam and take control of Muslims. And uh, they have been succeeding largely with governments, but I have a message for them. You may control governments, but you cannot control the people. Now, one way that the governments, of course, and this is just universal, work to control people is through media perceptions. And of course, in the West, we are largely controlled by Jewish interests. It's not even a secret anymore. Basically, Jews own and control Western media. Um, you mentioned in an article, as something I had never heard before, that one should be on the lookout for uh, Protestant Islam and CNN Al Jazeera propaganda on behalf of Protestant Islam. What is Protestant Islam? Okay. The Protestant movement uh, attacked Christianity uh, with the argument that they wanted to restore the pure faith, the original faith. And in the process, they targeted the spiritual heart of Christianity. And uh, almost destroyed it. Christianity or Christendom used to produce great sages, great Christian poets, people who had a great sense of the sacred and uh, who could convey that in their writings, in their speeches, and in their poetry. It's and that's all almost now. Yeah, they are, that, that's, those days seem to be in the past, yes. Yes. Then, secondly, Protestant, uh, um, Protestant attack on Christianity uh, reduced religion to the, the sacred text, the, the Bible, and uh, insisted on a literal interpretation or literal understanding, rather, of the Word of God. And uh, therefore religion became a matter of literally following the text. Um, this led to a drying up of spiritual insight, a drying up of spiritual wisdom, and the creation of people who followed an epistemology that knowledge comes only from observation, and knowledge does not come internally Mm -hmm. from intuition. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so you, you, you lost the, the wondrous beauty of the religious way of life that presented to you vibrations that you could feel when you're in the presence of a holy person. And you are attracted to people who had holiness in them. Um, and now you have uh, the religious individual who does not show any magnetism at all in his personality. He's simply about the word, the spoke, the written word. Um, this has been a disaster for Christianity because it allowed the hidden hand to then take control of these people like a pied piper and play tunes that they would have to dance to 
and they've been dancing to those tunes for the longest while. Uh, and this was part of the reason why they were able to succeed, the hidden hand was succeeding, was able to succeed in forging the Judeo-Christian alliance with, of course, the active participation of the Vatican. Christians had traditionally be very hostile to Jews because they accused them of having committed the ultimate crime of killing God himself. And now, lo and behold, we see this mysterious event in modern history of the emergence of a, a reconciliation between European Christians and European Jews and the emergence of friendship and an alliance, a Judeo-Christian alliance, which is today, of course, a Zionist Judeo and this Christian alliance Zion. appears to be, uh, from what I garner by your, your writings, in some type of alliance with Protestant Islam. The same phenomenon which was at work in Christianity, and incidentally also in Judaism, the reform movement in Judaism, that same movement came to Islam to attempt to achieve the same results in Islam. What today is called the Wahhabi or Salafi Islam is what I refer to as Protestant Islam. So the Wahhabi is Protestant, that's the key. The Wahhabi, and they don't like the term Wahhabi, so they reinvented themselves as Salafi. Now I don't, I don't offer any blanket condemnation because I have Salafi students who are students of mine. So, the same thing that happened to Protestants to Christianity is now taking this to Islam. And this is something again that I guess Islam will now have to deal with, as Christianity has already succumbed to this type of concept, which to me is a metaphysical war on the spirituality of people. You're listening to the facts that I guess Imam Hussein. You're on Inside the Eye Live on the Oracle Broadcasting Network. We'll be right back. See you on the other side. And welcome back. Top of the hour, 7 o'clock p.m. Uh, here locally in Amman, Jordan, I believe it's midnight in Kuala Lumpur, where our guest Imran Hussein is is uh, joining us from. Uh, Imran is, of course, an Islamic scholar, specializes much on Zionist issues, uh, Islam and its contemporary place. Islam, speaking this morning, early this morning here in Amman, uh, you were saying you have a unique perspective in Islam as, as among Islamic scholars precisely because of your education in geopolitics. Yes, one of the most important branches of knowledge now in the world is eschatology, the study of the end times. Uh, our philosophy of history uh, is one which uh, proclaims that history is not uh, meandering aimlessly but there is a certain process of history and an end of history. And uh, the end of history will witness the triumph of truth over falsehood and over all rivals. Um, and uh, that end of history will also witness the return of the true Messiah, son of Mary. The most powerful voice in the world to have prophesied the return of Jesus is the voice of Muhammad. Allah's blessings be upon them both. And by my calculation, and I'm entitled to calculate, I'm entitled to anticipate. It's not that I am looking into the future and seeing things that only God knows about. Of course not. I'm entitled to anticipate based upon the analysis of data. Every businessman does that, to anticipate business trends in the market, so why can't a scholar do the same thing? I anticipated uh, Dennis more than 15 years ago that the US dollar was going to collapse, it must collapse, and that when it did collapse it will bring down the American economy and will also bring down the entire world of paper money that came out of Redwoods. That's about to occur now. 
for well, sure, is, there sure is a lot of pressure to make it happen, that's for sure. Uh, what about the Arab Spring? This is really mm -hmm. seems to be the key in the Middle East. The Arab yes. Spring is the key right now to whether this planet goes in a peaceful way or into a much more violent war scenario. You know, in order to be able to penetrate the reality of the Arab Spring, you've got to go back again to the historical process and to eschatology. And this is where I was immensely lucky to have not only studied Islamic studies, but also to study the national politics, history of international relations, international economics, international monetary economics, etc. Because when I turned to eschatology, I found that not only did he prophesy the return of Jesus, and my estimate is we're probably about 25, 30 years away from that, he also informed us that prior to the return of Jesus, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Almighty God, was going to release into the world someone specially created by him, who is going to impersonate the true Messiah, known as the false Messiah. And in order for him to successfully impersonate the true Messiah, he's going to rule the world from Jerusalem. In order for him to do that, Number one, he'd have to liberate the Holy Land for the Jews. Number two, bring the Jews back to the Holy Land to reclaim it as their own. Number three, restore the of Israel in the Holy Anyway, Land. we're going right. to a break. We'll see you right back. And welcome back. It's the Fed. You are live inside the eye here on the Oracle Broadcasting Network. Good Saturday, August the 25th to you, wherever you are. Maybe it's already the 26th in the case of uh, uh, our guest, Imran Hussein in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, Good morning to you. Good uh, mo good tomorrow to you, Imran. Yes. In the in the Western way, in the Western world, and the the day begins at midnight. And exactly. And in, so in Islam, Islam, a day has to end before a new day begins. So when the sun sets and the day ends, a new day begins. Yeah. So that's your sunset. Sunset is the start of the new day. It's the end of one day and the start of another day. That's actually, I didn't know that. I've been here all this time. I didn't know I, that. I think, I think that a sunset is a far more wondrous experience and enlightening experience than midnight. You know, it's, uh, I guess something we'd have to just kind of meditate and reflect on and just kind of tune into for about a month to two months and see how it works for us. <laughs> So, uh, you know, talking about the, the, the Arab Spring, eschatology, etc. In Islam, and what brought me to, to your attention, what brought you to my attention are many people here in Jordan who follow my Kabbalistic work and they said, no, you need to, to check out this guy, his name is Imran Hussein, check him out, he's really good at, you know, this end of times, Zionism, etc. And you were talking to me this morning about a particular passage in the Quran that really predicts the rise of Zionism as you interpret it. Can you share a little bit about that? Well, to begin, we have to make a distinction between the external form of the arrow spring and the internal reality. And my... Uh, my view is that only eschatology can deliver uh, an explanation of the internal reality of the Arab Spring. Number two, that this was not the first Arab Spring. There was another one a hundred years earlier. And this one seems to be repeating what that other one did. Oh, okay. What about the one a hundred years earlier? Was, what happened then? So, I'm not aware of this. The one a hundred years earlier... Uh, was that uh, the, the, which targeted the Ottoman Islamic Empire to bring it up. It had already served Western Europe sufficiently. For about five to six hundred years, the Ottomans had faithfully served Western Europe by attacking and plunging a vicious knife into the heart of Eastern Christian Europe, uh, an unjust knife. Um, and so they didn't need the Ottomans anymore, and so they attacked the Ottomans in the First World War and broke up uh, the Middle East 
and brought into being governments that would be uh, 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 clients of theirs. That's how the Saudi regime emerged in Saudi Arabia, through an Arab Spring. Mm. Uh, and that's how, yeah, that's how uh, the, the, the Ottoman hold over Mecca and Medina was broken, and governments emerged that were clients of Britain and eventually clients of the United States as well. In this Arab Spring, we see something a little different, and that is they are attacking governments which are not prepared to bend their knees to the Zionists. There was no Arab Spring in Saudi Arabia. No? Yeah, yeah. neither Qatar, neither Bahrain. Well, Bahrain, there was some legitimate, but they put that down pretty fast. Oh, yes, oh, yes, and the, the Zionists are not worried about that at all. It is Libya and Syria who attacked, who were attacked and um, um, targeted to bring down governments which were standing up to the Zionists. Now, what about in what, what about in Quran? The idea of many people believe that the current political predicament we have was predicted in Quran. Yes, this is again eschatology. Okay. Um, the Quran uh, explains to us about the Holy Land and about the destiny of the Holy Land. And that the Holy Land was given to the Jews. I don't know why the New York Times does not publish that on their front page every day of the year. How come CNN does not mention that? And Al Jazeera, which is the sister of CNN, that the Quran says that the Holy Land was given to the Jews. That's there in the Quran. But they never mention it. But the Quran says that the Holy Land was given to the Jews conditionally. Whereas the Torah says it was given unconditionally. Which one are you going to believe? It was given conditionally and every time you violated the conditions, you were thrown out. So the <laughs> you Jews were thrown were out Torah. more than they can count. That's right. So the Quran is correct that it was given conditionally. But then after the time of Jesus, then the Quran says that we broke you up into bits and pieces and scattered you all over the world. And then the Quran says that he placed a ban that you can never return to this town, namely Jerusalem. You cannot reclaim this town as your own until a certain moment comes in history. That is when God and Magad are released into the world and with their indestructible power, they take control of power in the world and they spread out in all directions. Then you will find the Jews returning to the Holy Land to reclaim it as their own. So they basically, they butchered, they butchered the mythologies and kind of morphed it and used their media to convince everybody that this is the way that the religious texts are supposed to read. That's right, that's right. They have changed the word of God. Now, if you go to the Quran, you get a different picture. Yeah, in Quran, they warn against this alliance between Christians and Jews. There is a verse of the Quran which I have interpreted for the first time in the way I have done because of my studies of eschatology. It is in the fifth chapter, verse number 51, I think, where Allah speaks about, uh, gives a command, O oh, you who have faith in Allah, do not take the Jews and do not take the Christians as your friends and allies. And all, and this is the beginning of the verse, and all the commentaries of the Quran focus upon some historical events of Jews and Christians and so on. But no one ever attempted to look at this verse in a holistic perspective. The Qur'an could not have been speaking about all Jews and all Christians because many verses of the Qur'an would deny that. So then which Jews and which Christians? The next words which follow in the verse give us the answer. Ba'aduhum awliya Meaning don't take such Jews and don't take such Christians as your friends and allies who are friends and allies of each other. And that is anticipating the Judeo-Christian alliance which eventually emerged in Europe, in Western Europe, not Eastern. Not Eastern, Western. And the Quran goes on to say that whoever amongst you turn to these Christian Jews, Christians and Jews, as friends and allies, you now belong to them. You no longer belong to them.
That's the Magus on the Arabia. I put this. Very good. We'll get more, but what it sounds to me is that basically the unholy alliance between Christian Zionism and Judaism is the bane. We will be right back. This is the Fed with Imran Hussein here on the Oracle Broadcasting Network. Welcome back, everybody. It's the Fed. You are live inside the eye here on the Oracle Broadcasting Network. Uh, good Saturday, August 25th to you, wherever you are, 26th. In the case of some people, our guest today, Imran Hussein. Islamic scholar coming out of Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Imran, when we went into the break, we really, you were talking about this one particular verse that deals specifically with the unholy alliance between Christian Zionism and modern day Judaism, which I guess we could call Zionism, but it's kind of like inseparable politically nowadays. So basically, this was a te- could, we can almost look at that as a template being referred to in Quran about the events we find ourselves today within the political sphere, the political alliances that are trying to bring about this concept called Armageddon. Yes, I have been attempting in my public lectures and in my writings to explain this verse of the Quran, this pivotally important verse of the Qur'an for Islamic eschatology uh, to my Muslim audiences. Um, the Salafi Muslims don't seem to be happy with me. Really? Uh, they, for the Salafi? They entered, they entered into an alliance with, with NATO to bring down the Libyan government. Uh, NATO actively supported them with bombing the daylights out of the Libyan armed forces and they succeeded in Libya and consequence of which today Libya is now a NATO controlled country and when the attack on Egypt is to come and it is to come because once you study eschatology you know that the attack will come from the east Israel and from the west NATO a naval blockade from the north the Mediterranean and with southern Sudan in uh, almost an alliance with Israel now, you can also see trouble from the south. So Israel uh, has cornered Egypt from all four sides now. The Arab Spring was meant to bring to power governments that would be so-called Islamic governments. And that's what they desperately want in Syria, a Salafi government in Syria which will be waging holy war on Israel. <laughs> yes. So that Israel would have causes better. That's what they want. Causes better. So that they can wage the pre planned war that will decimate the Arabs. So the Arab Spring, Dennis, is meant to prepare the way for the Arab slaughter. My Arab audience is going to be uh, dismayed by these remarks of mine. But I've said it earlier. The Arab Spring is meant to prepare the way for the Arab slaughter. This verse of the Quran is pivotally important. I have interpreted this way for the first time ever in Islamic history. But as yet I do not have support from the established world of Islamic scholarship. Those who are not scholars of Islam, they are the ones who are almost totally in agreement with me. But I cannot seem to make a dent on the established world of Islamic scholarship, that is. Mm. Now, what about Russia? What's Russia's role? We see Russia playing a pivotal pivotal role in Syria. We see China playing a pivotal role in Syria. What is the role of Russia within Islamic eschatology? That's a very important question, Dennis. I wrote a book entitled An Islamic View of Gog and Magog in the Modern World in which I came to the conclusion, prematurely so, prematurely so, uh, that Russia was Magog and the Anglo-American Zionist alliance was God. I think that was a premature statement on my part. It would be more correct to say, and this is the first time that I'm mentioning this publicly, it would be more correct to say that God and Magog were operating as a hidden hand within Russia as well as within the Anglo-American alliance. 
and the objective was for God and Magad to take these two powers into a collision course with each other. Because in the same way that the Ottoman Empire had outlived its utility, had already served Western Europe sufficiently by subduing and butchering Eastern Europe, so to the two superpowers, the Anglo-American uh, alliance and the Russian alliance, have already outlived their utility for Israel. Israel doesn't need them anymore. And so you leave... Well, why, do you, I'll tell you, why do you say that? I mean, why do you say that? Israel needs to rule the world. Okay. And Israel would not want to have any formidable obstacle in its way. Well, another way One, you could say that Israel already controls these engines or these entities and therefore they are already serving Israel. The cover is coming off the lid. And the cover is coming off and many in the Western world are now beginning to see and understand uh, what the hidden hand has been doing so for so long in destroying Western civilization, corrupting it and destroying it. Uh, Western man is intelligent, and when once the brainwashing can be washed away, he can think and understand, and many are understanding. And this growing understanding in the West poses a tremendous threat to Israel. Uh, in order for Israel to rule the world, it will be beneficial for Israel, for both Western Europe and the um, uh, United States and Canada and Russia to mutually destroy each other as military powers. What will remain after that in the aftermath of nuclear war will pose no threat to Israel. But Russia is also, from the Islamic perspective, not only a country which has been infiltrated by Gog and Magog, but Russia is also Rome or the Byzantine Empire. And uh, the, the Prophet has spoken about, the Quran speaks well about that Rome, and the Prophet has spoken about an alliance with Rome. And we can see that now, alliance... When you say Rome, people think that you're thinking Rome, the Vatican, but you're really not referring to that, are you? No, Rome began with Rome, when Rome was pagan. But it's Ru, are you... U-M or something to that, correct? You can, you can pronounce it as R-O-O-M. Room. The pronunciation, room, yeah. Okay, it and room is really Moscow. No, it began in Italy. Okay. As a pagan city. A pagan city. And then Constantine took it out of Italy and went to a city that he named Constantinople. And there... They built the great cathedral, the Hagia Sophia, which was the pride of all Christendom. That is the room that the Quran refers to, not the one in Italy, but the one in Constantinople. And the Quran speaks positively about that room. When the Ottomans took over Constantinople, then Rum moved to Russia. And our Prophet has spoken about an alliance with Rome. And I believe that that alliance is already showing signs of blossoming because Iran already has very close ties with Russia. Syria has close ties with Russia. Uh, Syria hosts a Russian naval base. And Pakistan is now backing away from the Zionist embrace and, and entering into closer ties with Russia. And China, um, we might add. And that's right. They already had long ties with China. But what is most interesting of all is that the Prophet has also spoken about a conquest of Constantinople. They just changed the name to Istanbul. But since the Prophet referred to it as Constantinople, I will lose what they say. Okay. Going into a break, Imran. Hold your thought there. This is the fast with Imran Hussein here on Inside the Eye Live on the Oracle Broadcasting Network. Welcome back, everybody. It's the Fetz. You're live inside the eye, coming to you from Amman, Jordan, where, again, it's uh, dark now. It's uh, I think it's dark. Actually, what I did, guys, is I, I moved my apartment. Uh, the studio that I've made here is a bit on a, a noisy area, so I soundproofed my room. Uh, so, actually, I can't see outside. You know, I've got deep foam covering all my windows so that we can keep all 
the background noise as much as we can to a minimum. I think it's working uh, actually quite good. It's very cheap, but uh, cheap strategy here. Now, if you'd like to join us in the chat room, again, the Inside the Eye Live is the uh, inside the eye live dot com is the website, and just click on the live chats. Come on in. Still got a good crowd in there. Imran Hussein from Kuala Lumpur is our guest today. Imran, how about giving out your website and anything you want to quickly promote there? Um, my website is www.imranhussein, I M R A N H O S E I N dot O R G, uh, and we now have a bookstore at imranhussein.com. And we also have uh, live uh, streaming at imranhussein.tv. Uh, really? You have your own TV station? Streaming television. <laughs> That's good. You know, your views, Imran, is amazing. Over a million. You have so many YouTube videos with over a million, over a million views. It's very impressive what you're doing out there. Well, the Internet is a two-edged sword. <laughs> <laughs> It is a, it is the equivalent of an information Guantanamo because of the immense power it wields and can be used by those who control it. Well, yeah, I think but we it, have to understand that we have to go compete. We just can't be silent. On the other hand, it has also given me an opportunity to reach audiences I could never have reached otherwise. Exactly. Uh, uh, only over the last five years, really. My website has grown so great, and the large number of people who are now listening to me, it is something wonderful. But it's a two-edged sword. Do you have any engagements coming up? On the 1st of September, uh, I have a seminar on Islamic eschatology. Really? Something is, yeah, it's right here in uh, Kuala Lumpur, and there's information on my website. It is a very important subject because uh, we can anticipate nuclear war between the United States and Russia, and they're being set up. A hidden hand is setting them up, I think. I, have a, I, have a, just, I just want to be a devil's advocate real quick. Some of us who study the various, I'm a Kab Kabbalist, Kabbalist, not, I'm a hermetic Kabbalist, not, uh, not a rabbinical Kabbalist, uh, which means I study the hidden messages and codes within the English language, uh, basically Francis Bacon, people like that. Now, when we study these texts, we look at sometimes these texts as being blueprints for the hidden hand. Have you considered that as part of your analysis? No, I don't do that. Okay, I go to why? The Quran, I go to the Quran, I use the Quran, and I use the word of the Prophet as my primary sources of... Uh, data for Islamic eschatology, and I try as much as I possibly can not to go to other sources. Mm -hmm. That is not to say that the, the Freemasonry and Illuminati are not important to be studied, and the world of the occult is not important. It is just that I want to keep a certain purity of my scholarship and allow others to do that work, and they can then complement my work. For example, there's old Dr. Omar Zaid, who's going to conduct his seminar the day after mine, September the 2nd. And he specializes in those in those fields, while I stay with the Quran and with the Hadith. Okay, I can appreciate uh, that. No, really, I appreciate that, because I, I took the same purity approach when I developed my work also, so I can appreciate where you're coming from, quite honestly. Uh, going real quick now, this end of times, you know, what is the scenario about the end of times in Islamic, in this Islamic, in your Islamic studies? At the very heart of the subject of the end time in Islam is the return of the true Messiah. Okay. And I said to you earlier, my, and I anticipate probably another 25 or 30 years from now. Okay, so what the events time. today are setting that up? Number one, he who has been programmed to impersonate the Messiah, the Christians call him the Antichrist, the Prophet called him the Jal, the false Messiah. Jal, yes. He has to, number one, in order to, to, in order to successfully impersonate the true Messiah, he's got to liberate the Holy Land for the Jews. He's done it already. Number two, 
No, okay. How does how has he done that? How has he done that? He's done that through Britain. With the British yeah. Army defeating the Ottoman Empire in nineteen seventeen. Okay, British what about Army. the Dome of the Rock? The Dome of the Rock is a building. It's there in Jerusalem. Okay. Now Jews believe in that, that that has to come down and they need to build their temple and I've got many Knights Templar friends who actually b- believe this philosophy. In order, for, in order for the false messiah to successfully impersonate the true messiah, number one, he's got to liberate the Holy Land for the Jews. He's already done that. Number two, he's got to bring the Jews back to the Holy Land to reclaim it as their own. He's already done that. Number three, He'll have to restore his state of Israel in the Holy Land and get the Jews to believe that this is Holy Israel. He's already done that. Okay, can I argue with those? Number four, he's got to cause that state of Israel to replace the United States of America as a new ruling state in the world and to impose what may be called Pax Judaica in succession to Pax Americana in the same way that Pax America succeeded Pax Britannica. You know, what's interesting about that, Imran, is there's some 1920s, 1930s Kabbalistic codes that say the exact same thing. The passage from Pax Britannica to Pax Americana to Pax Judaica is a part of the study of history that cannot be penetrated without eschatology. In order for Israel to become the new ruling state in the world, she's got to bring down the United States. From the time Israel attacked Syria or Pakistan... Well, hasn't the they made big inroads with the attack on 9-11? 9-11 was meant to prepare the way. To prepare the way. Number one, for the destruction of Pakistan's nuclear weapons and nuclear plants. Because you put the blame on Afghanistan and therefore you're sending your troops into Afghanistan from where you're trying for 10 years now to destabilize Pakistan. And they have succeeded to some extent in destabilizing Pakistan. But eventually they're going to have to move in and destroy the nuclear plants and nuclear weapons because that poses too great a threat to Israel. In order for Israel to rule the world, she's got to bring down the United States, the U.S. dollar and the U.S. economy and trap the United States in a war in which the United States can face defeat. I have mentioned these, these views of mine in several other interviews. That could be uh, an attack of, which will cause Iran to retaliate by taking Bahrain. And then Israel, when Iran is threatening Saudi Arabia, the Saudi Arabia invoke a secret treaty is, they have is, to do. Is that. Iran strong enough to go after Bahrain? Oh yes, Iran can take Bahrain any day. Any day. Really? Any day. It is, it is <laughs> where Iran takes Bahrain, which of course Israel will want Iran to take Bahrain. It is when Iran takes Bahrain and threatens Saudi Arabia that the trap would be set to force the United States to intervene on Saudi soil. And there the United States could face defeat. And then Israel will have to intervene to save the United States from defeat, and that will spell the whole, for the whole world to see the transfer of power. You saw a similar you know, thing. I'll tell you what, as an American, we hear these stories. They're interesting, but it's very hard for an American to believe that Israel, which we see as basically a crappy little country, has the wherewithal to save anybody, even themselves. Well, you can ask every single American president over the last how many hundred years whether or not an an American politician could win an election by signing up against Israel. Now this is what it is. The most this is powerful ridiculous. Politically, it's impossible to defeat them right the now. It's very difficult. The most powerful country in the world today. And no American politician can ever hope to win an election by standing up against Israel. And then you still say, little Israel? <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you what. You, you make some tough points. I can't argue against. It's the Fed with Imran Hussein here on the Oracle Broadcasting Network. Uh, Inside the Eye Live, Intelligent Media for Politically Aware. We will be right back right after this. All right. Welcome back, everybody. This is the Fetch, Inside the Eye Live. 
intelligent media for the politically aware. Last segment, uh, what's turned out to be quite an informative show on eschatology, eschatology, end of time discussion with our scholar Imran Hossein, who's giving, really speaking about eschatology from an Islamic perspective. Imran, real quick, we got just uh, one segment to go. Iran and end of times, where does Iran fit into the equation? Iran uh, is a country which uh, is Shia, and the Shia are the first sectarian movement to have emerged in Islam. They do not recognize Abu Bakr Siddiq and Omar Farooq and Uthman any as uh, legitimate leaders of the world of Islam after the death of the Prophet, Allah blessing be upon him. They believe that succession to leadership in Islam is hereditary and it is restricted to the family of the Prophet, Allah blessing be upon him. We hold that view to be false. Okay. But despite that, we hold the view that the Shia are Muslims and we do not consider them to be non-Muslims. Um, However, the Shia are the ones who are showing the greatest integrity at this time. Iran. Surprisingly, uh, isn't it? <laughs> uh, showing the greatest integrity at this time. They're standing up against the Zionists and standing up for the Palestinian cause. And showing, uh, uh, building an alliance with Russia, which is what the rest of the world of Islam should have been doing. And so Iran is... Uh, well, by the way, Imran, by the way, when you, that, that comment there, one of the reasons they took out Libya, they want to take out Syria, they took out Tunisia, because many of these countries were client states of Russia. They were not client states of Russia, they were client states of the West. The Tunisian government, the Tunisian government was acting on, in accordance with the Zionist plan. The, the, the Egyptian government was in Obara was acting in accordance with the Zionist plan. Syria? Syria was different. Syria had an alliance with Russia. Mm -hmm. So these were spontaneous, these appeared to be spontaneous uh, uprisings in Tunisia and Egypt, but a lot of work went into it. Of course, yeah, happened. now we understand it was all free plan, free package. A lot, of work, a lot of work went into it, and we don't have the time in this interview to explain all the different intricacies. True. Um, but... Iran is important for us because it is leading the way and I believe that the, uh, the attack that is coming on Iran is meant to remove the present government of Iran and to replace it with a, uh, a, a, a Shia government that will put Shia interests first and that, that Shia government in Iran might be able to make an accommodation with Israel. That is the danger that we face. Okay, how about Turkey and end of times? The Turkish government has been taken for a ride. Many I people believe that actually. They're, they're, yeah, they're playing a very bad. bad hand. They have a good hand, but they're playing it wrong. Yeah, they, they were taken for a ride. I don't think that they were part and parcel of a cons conspiracy uh, uh, in the flotilla to Gaza. I believe that they were innocent, but that whoever it was was planning that was able to build a certain degree of popularity for the Turkish government when the attack took place on the flotilla. Um, but the Turkish government has been taken for a ride by the Zionists, and there's a much bigger picture at work in, in, in Turkey, it's not just the government. It's a, it's a Sufi movement in, in Turkey which seems to have been infiltrated by the Zionists. Um, but I was saying earlier that our prophet has prophesied the conquest of Constantinople. And uh, the Turkish government can change the name to Istanbul and prohibit the use of the name Constantinople. But that's not an effect because Prophet Muhammad referred to it as Constantinople. And the reason why I believe the Constantinople is going to be conquered in an end time conquest, which is coming, is because there are significant military implications. And that is that you break the hold of NATO over Constantinople. Israel's security 
is significantly linked with Constantinople because the Russian Navy will have a passageway through the Bosphorus into the Mediterranean if NATO is removed from Constantinople. And so this end time prophecy about a Muslim conquest of Constantinople, in my opinion, is meant to bring room into the big picture. Rome will now take on in Israel. And the Russian Navy, the nuclear powered Russian Navy, will now get out of the Black Sea and into the Mediterranean to be able to head straight to Israel. Now, in your opinion, Jews, international Jewish organizations, Jewish uh, political power in the United States and the Western world at large, they're working overtime to really drag the West into a war that will see its demise. Yes, but not all Jews. Not all not Jews, all but it's okay. We can use yeah. the term. I mean, it's our language. We can use the language as we I want. Know. There are Jews working overtime to make this happen, and they do represent the elite of their culture. They have already brought down the United States to its knees. The United States is just tottering at the moment. The U.S. dollar is in a place called ICU, Internal Intensive Care Unit of a Hospital. The United States dollar is going to collapse at any moment. And then it's going to have to be demonetized. And they have to replace it with some other money. I don't know what. But that will be temporarily until eventually electronic money takes over. And once the electronic money takes over, governments have no control over money. The banking system controlled by the Zionists will now control money all over the world. So yes, they are bringing down the West. In Quran, is there any rationalism for this seeming, seeming hatred for Western ideology? On behalf of, of uh, Torah, Torah-related religion? Western civilization just entered on the stage of history a few hundred years ago. Correct, yeah. The Quran, the Quran was revealed more than 1400 years ago. Yet there are verses in the Quran which anticipate what has happened in the world. And I mentioned the verse about the Judeo-Christian alliance. Uh, there are other verses of the Quran which warn about materialism philosophy of materialism which will destroy the world of the sacred and uh, that has already taken place now and modern western civilization is at the vanguard of spreading materialism all over the world and destroying the sense of the sacred. All of these things are anticipated in the past. Hmm. Uh, real quick, you got the non-aligned movement in Iran this week. What do you see coming out of that? The non-aligned movement does not exist anymore in reality, this paper, because they're all aligned. And most of them are all aligned with, with the United States. Uh, India, supposed to be a leader of the non-aligned movement. India is now Israel's most strategic ally in the world after the United States. It's you still consider India to be non-aligned? Hmm. Um, point. Yugoslavia was uh, one of the leading states of the non-aligned movement. A conspiracy which cost the lives of lots of Bosnian Muslims. A conspiracy led to NATO's victory in Eastern Europe with the breakup of Yugoslavia, which was essentially a victory for NATO. And then the emergence of these independent states um, uh, and NATO bases taking, taking over all those parts of the world. So NATO is now in Eastern Europe with a very foot, firm foothold. Mm. Uh, now, Imran, 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 we're actually out of time. Why don't you go ahead and give your website out one more time. The website is... In, uh, ImranHussein.org You can do a Google search for Imran Hussein I-M-R-E-N H-O-N Okay uh, Check it out guys A wonderful guest So much to see on YouTube Imran Nazar Hussein or Imran Hussein 
Imran, thanks for coming. It's the Fetch. You've been listening to Inside the Ad Live, Intelligent Media, for the Politically Aware, here on the Oracle Broadcasting Network.